Uh, hi, UVic students. Uh, my name's Emily Lowen. I'm your UVSS Director of Campaigns and Community Relations, and today I'm joined by Murray Rankin. Um, Murray, how's it going? Great. Uh, thanks very much, Emily, for having me on, on your program. It's great. I want to make sure that at the start, people are aware, your listeners, that there's opportunities to vote by mail in advance. There's already half a million people in BC who've asked for early mail-in ballots, and of course on October 24th, which is Election Day. Great. And Marie, which riding are you running in? I'm running in Oak Bay Gordon Head, which includes the University of Victoria. It's a riding I've lived in. I taught at the university for many, many years, and uh, I'm very proud to, uh, I hope, become the MLA of uh, Oak Bay Gordon Head if I succeed in the election. Excellent. And just remind us, uh, what party are you, are you running with in this election? I'm with the BC NDP. Okay. Thanks, Marie. Um, we'll start off with some rapid fire questions. Um, <laughs> Okay, what's your favorite coffee shop in Victoria? Hide and Seek on Oak Bay Avenue. It's a good one. Um, do you have a guilty pleasure TV show or movie? Borgen on uh, Netflix. It won't surprise you. It's a political program about a Danish, a female Danish prime minister. I love it. <laughs> Are you more of a, a camping or a cabin kind of person? Uh, I think I'm more of a camping person. Excellent. Okay, let's get into the real stuff. So <laughs> that is the real stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Uh, students overwhelmingly believe that the climate emergency requires an immediate and effective response from all levels of government. Um, I'm wondering what specific actions you will take to ensure that BC meets the required milestones of at least a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. I couldn't agree more. We have a climate emergency. I taught environmental law at the University of Victoria for a decade. I know and care deeply about these issues. I have to say that we have to all work together in a coordinated way, all levels of government, number one. Number two, we continue to have to price carbon, of course. Number three, we need to make massive investments in a transition to renewables, a just transition so workers are, are not left behind and that we, we have uh, uh, zero emission vehicles everywhere by 2040. I think that's a key thing. And of course, because so much of, our, uh, of the climate uh, uh, contribution to climate change in our provinces from transportation, we need to hit that head on. And government has to model what kind of behavior we need. So the government has to lead by example. Those are some of the things we need to do and there's so much more. Thank you. Um so four years after Bill 23, which is the Sexual Violence and Misconduct Policy Act, um, we continue to hear from our students that many post-secondary institutions haven't actually implemented uh, effective sexual violence and misconduct policies. Um, I'm wondering if you plan to create and regulate minimum standards um, and or streamlined funding for post-secondary institutions to really uh, implement these policies effectively. Well, the key point is that students have an absolute right to be safe and protected from sexualized violence on and off campus. About one in five women will experience sexualized violence while studying at a, a post-secondary institution. It's completely unacceptable. But unlike the Liberals, we're actually making progress, Emily, on this issue. We've invested in a province-wide sexual violence prevention campaign. In 2019, we invested over $700,000 in to present and respond to sexualized violence on campus. And just this year, the BC NDP government announced a three-year, $10 million grant program to support emergency sexual uh, assault response services throughout the province. So we're on the right track. We also, of course, have Mitzi Dean, MLA, Parliamentary Secretary for the Status of Women. And I think you'll see some announcements on this issue coming up. Thank you. Um so in terms of affordability, costs like tuition and housing continue to rise while students' incomes have dropped significantly during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I'm wondering how you will tackle the rising costs of education for post-secondary students. Affordability is probably the thing I hear most about, aside from climate change, perhaps, uh, and the pandemic, of course, in this campaign. You know, the BC NDP government has eliminated interest on provincial student loans. It's eliminated tuition completely for people who were formerly youth in care and funded over 2,400 beds at universities in the last three, three years, including 700 uh, at, uh, on the way at UVic. 
while the Liberals only created 130 beds across the province in 16 years. So to, like, to make life more affordable, we've also eliminated MSP premiums and, and capped rent increases to inflation. And we're lowering ICBC costs by 20% as of May. It's all about making life a little bit more affordable for all of us. And students are particularly a hard hit. And so that's why some of these investments are, are being made to just make life a little bit more affordable for all of us, including, of course, students. Great. Um, so how will you address the housing shortage, uh, particularly the acute uh, housing crisis in Victoria that disproportionately impacts students? Well, like I said earlier, you know, I was up at university and saw the new student housing facility right next to the sub. And, you know, there's about 700 new units uh, ultimately being created there. And what that does is it not does, doesn't just create housing on campus for students, but if you think about it, it makes space that they might have uh, uh, lived in in Fernwood or who, wherever else in the city available to others. So it helps alleviate the housing shortage that are uh, that exists. The cost of housing is just way too expensive in this whole region. Everybody knows that. And it's not a simple solution, but we're trying to make uh, uh, housing investments to deal with the homeless all the way to affordability for housing, you know, with our speculation tax that the Liberals would cut, which created 110,000 new units already, the speculation and vacancy tax tax, which uh, is, is freeing up houses that otherwise would have been empty. So these are the kind of things that we need to do. It's going to have to involve the federal government, which finally is stepping up after years of neglect in the housing sector. It's going to involve the CRD. It's going to involve the cities. And of course, it's going to involve the provincial government. We need to work in hand in hand in order to address what is obviously a complex but critical issue. Great. Um, I'm also wondering what your stance is on free post-secondary education. It's, it's an interesting idea, you know. Um, I, I have to say that it's one that is not something that has been uh, at the center of our, of our platform, but what John Horgan and his team have committed to do, of course, is to deal with those affordability issues, like uh, eliminating interest on the student loans, free tuition for youth and care, as I said earlier, and created the BC Access Grant that gives up to $4,000 to student, students up front uh, to cover the costs uh, that they are going to incur. I mentioned funding more beds, uh, more housing units on campuses. And we funded an additional 2,439 student beds across the province at post-secondary uh, institutions. Uh, whereas the Liberals, BC Liberals, in their 16 years created a grand total of 130 beds that they funded, obviously a drop in the bucket. The Liberals tripled university tuition costs and canceled needs-based grants. The, uh, we've invested $14 million to help thousands of youth, women, and underrepresented groups get apprentices and, and employment in skilled trades. Sometimes people will finish a degree at University of Victoria and they'll go to Camosun and get a different skill. We're trying to make those opportunities equally available for students. There's a lot of work to do. It's all part of the affordability agenda. And I, I, I couldn't tell you how important it is for everyone in our community, students included, to address that head on. Great. Um, and I'm also wondering, uh, students are, uh, make up a, the largest demographic of transit users in our region. And I'm wondering if you support changing the Transit Act to allow for a student representative to have a voting seat on transit commissions in BC. I take the bus every day to work and I have to tell you, well, I see so many students because I'm on the bus number seven or number, you know, number three, a lot of them going to the university. So I see the point is so many students use that, use the transit system. So to me, it's a very interesting idea. It makes really good sense to me. I, I figure students are one of the biggest demographics using our transit system. Um, so to my way of thinking, it's, a, it's an idea that's definitely worth considering. Thank you. Um, so UVic students have also expressed a strong desire to create a more socially just province. Um, current measures by municipalities to reduce systemic racism in police forces simply haven't solved the problem. Um, and economic inequities in marginalized groups continue to create these generational challenges uh, for children, families, and communities. Um, Murray, I'm wondering what specific changes you think should be made to the Police Act to address systemic racism in policing. Excellent question. Everyone in British Columbia has a right to be treated fairly by our police 
and especially a black, indigenous, and other people of color. That hasn't been the case for everyone. And I think it's very clear that there has been systemic racism. Our Attorney General has said that. And so in June of last year, John Horgan and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, they established a special committee looking into the Police Act to review the issue of systemic race, uh, racism in police forces. Uh, and you know, another issue is the ability of police to deal effectively with people with mental health addictions and other, other challenges. And we have brought out therefore ACT teams, including social workers and psychologists, not just police, to deal with people in that community. That report is coming back to the legislature in the spring. It's going to be very important. It's, a port, it's an important issue to me. I worked in Parliament as Member of Parliament to expunge criminal records for people who had possession of cannabis in their past on their record. And disproportionately, Emily, those were people of color. Those were Indigenous people who had a record, who couldn't therefore often rent an apartment, get a job, coach soccer because they had that record for something which is now perfectly legal. That's an indication of how important I think it is that we get a handle on these issues. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and giving such thoughtful answers today, Marie. Um, is there, you know, a way students can reach out to you to get more information? I, thank you, Emily. I, I would like that very much. Um, I'm murrayrankin.com on the internet. Uh, it is a place you can learn more about me, see the kind of people at University of Victoria who've endorsed me. I, um, I, I would like students to feel comfortable to contact me uh, on, uh, through that website and I'll reach out. Also on Twitter, Facebook and the like, reach out and talk about any issues that are important. You did a great job of covering many of the key ones that I've heard about from, from students in the writing. I think that's really helpful in getting the message out. So thank you for having me on. Of course, thank you.